Welcome to the McGill Faculty of Law, Inspiring Legal Leadership for Global Challenges. Pierre Montrachassiné à Montréal, nous réunions de la monde. I'm Robert Lecky, the Dean of the Faculty, and I welcome you this evening on behalf of the Faculty and on behalf of the Centre for Human Rights and Legal Pluralism. For some of you, this may be a welcome back after a long period without intellectual activity in our buildings that's open to the public. We've been teaching in person since late August 2021, but the return to in-person events open to the broader public has been a gradual one. This event was initially scheduled for March 2020, and we were all convinced that this was not one to do on Zoom, and I'm so pleased we're here together this evening. Vous êtes venu ou revenu à une faculté de droit qui est située sur le territoire traditionnel du peuple Ganigahaga. Quant à elle, l'île appelée Montréal a longtemps servi à titre de lieu, lieu de rencontre et d'échange d'autres nations autochtones, y compris les Algonquins. Par ailleurs, l'hommage de notre bienfaiteur fondateur, James McGill, a compté au moins cinq personnes vivant en esclavage. Jack, Sarah et Marie-Louise étaient noirs et marie Potamian était autochtone. Il avait aussi un garçon autochtone dont nous ignorons le nom. Il y a un projet de recherche en cours qui vise d'approfondir nos connaissances des rapports historiques entre notre université, le colonialisme de peuplement et l'esclavage. I wish at the outset to recognize those associated with the Center for Human Rights and Legal Pluralism, who are our hosts and organizers of today's events. We have the co-directors of the Center, Professors Nandini Vermanyajam and Frédéric Maigret, Sharon Webb, the Center's extraordinarily gifted and effective coordinator, Shona Moreau, student coordinator, and Professor Darren Rosenblum, who earlier this afternoon hosted the Martin Roy Student Colloquium. And I add a shout out to Martin Roy. Martin, there she is. Yes. And the four McGill Law students who presented brilliant and provocative papers on matters ranging from sexual privacy on dating apps to what responses to the AIDS crisis can teach us about COVID-19. Seth Gordon, Linnea Kornhauser, Andy Huang Lafra, and Raphael Schmieder Gropen. And I can add that while it was a close race, Andy received the prize for best paper. Congratulations to the four students. I'm delighted to extend a special welcome to colleagues associated with IMK advocates, including Maître Douglas Mitchell, BCL 88, LOB 88, Doug is the M in IMK, and Maître Audrey Bachter, BCL LOB 05. IMK has many ties with the Faculty of Law. A substantial number of its talented litigators are members of our alumni community, and several are actively involved in teaching and contributing otherwise to our students' professional development and success. I'm about to turn over the microphone to Audrey Bachter. Audrey is a former clerk to Chief Justice Beverly McLaughlin of the Supreme Court of Canada and a past president of the Canadian Bar Association, Quebec Division. She's a highly respected litigator who pleads regularly at every level of court. And I won't list all her cases, but for the audience tonight, two are especially relevant. So first, Audrey was lead counsel to the Quebec class members in the LGBT purge class action against the Government of Canada for systemic discrimination against LGBT members of the military, RCMP, and public service. And second, she acts, continues to do so, as the lead pro bono counsel to the Center for Gender Advocacy and named plaintiffs in a major constitutional challenge to Quebec laws regarding the rights of trans and non-binary people. In 2020, Audrey was listed as one of the top 25 most influential lawyers in Canada by Canadian lawyer and was named Woman of the Year at the Canadian Law Awards. In 2021, she received the Canadian Bar Association SOGIC Ally Award for her work in public interest litigation, advancing equality for LGBTQ2 plus people in Canada. Audrey Bachter. Thank you very much. Um, it's, a, it's a huge honor to be here uh, on behalf of IMK to introduce the Michelle Douglas Lecture uh, held today for the first time in conjunction with the Martinois Student Colloquium. Uh, this lecture and colloquium will take place every two years. So this is the inaugural event, uh, but will not be the last. It's an event that we look forward to uh, supporting and participating in for years to come. Being able to help bring the, the purge class action to a successful resolution was an enormous honor for our firm, uh, for me personally, for my colleagues, Jean-Michel, Olga, Manon, who worked on the file, 
and really for our entire firm who, who supported the file from the outset. The legal profession has its ups and downs, but one of the greatest privileges of being an advocate is being entrusted with telling someone's story. Through legal action, one person or a few per people's stories can serve to tell the stories of thousands of others. We help move things along, but it's the heroes of the story who through pain, sacrifice, and courage change things for everyone. Through this lectureship, IMK wanted to not only honor Michelle and through the colloquium Martin, but also to build a, help build a space where community members, allies, students, activists, and academics could all come together to keep learning, working, advocating, and making change happen on issues affecting the LGBTQ communities. We can't think of a better space than the Center for Human Rights and Legal Pluralism here at McGill. Having had a chance to attend the student colloquium today, I can say without a doubt that the future looks very bright. We're so grateful to Dean Leckie, to Nandini Raminujan, and everyone at the Center for Human Rights and Legal Pluralism and the broader law faculty for all the work invested in making this happen. I couldn't possibly name everyone because I know there are just so many people involved in making this event a success. Um, mostly, thank you, Michelle and Martine. Thank you, Audrey. Uh, I really want to say just how pleased I am that IMK made the donations to endow the permanent funding for the Michelle Douglas Lecture and Martin Wa Colloquium. Around about the same time, a group of alumni were fundraising to create the Everett Clippert Scholarship, which is awarded each year to an outstanding undergraduate or graduate student entering the Faculty of Law. Preference is given to students having demonstrated a commitment to working on issues facing marginalized members of LGBT communities. And so the Faculty of Law like McGill University more broadly, is working hard to advance inclusion and foster the flourishing of members of groups for whom the university hasn't always been a welcoming or a safe space. And I want to say this evening how proud I am that initiatives related to our LGBTQ communities figure among them. And so now it's my privilege to introduce our keynote speaker, Michelle Douglas. Michelle had a 30-year career as a public servant, retiring in 2019 from the position of Director of International Relations at the Canadian Department of Justice. In that role, she represented Canada at international meetings of the Commonwealth Organization of American States in the G7. And that alone might merit, Michelle, a speaking invitation to the McGill Faculty of Law. But much more pertinent for this evening's purposes, Michelle served as an officer in the Canadian Armed Forces from 1986 to 89, and was honorably discharged from the military in 1989 under the military's LGBT purge. And we'll hear about it more shortly directly from her, but she's had a 30-year-long record of advancing social justice and human rights activism, beginning, if I'm not mistaken, in 1992 with a landmark legal challenge against the military's discriminatory policies against LGBT service members. Michelle has served on a number of boards for not-for-profit organizations, including the Mikhail Jean Foundation. She was awarded the Queen Elizabeth II Diamond Jubilee Medal in 2012. And speaking more personally, I've been trying to get Michelle to the Faculty of Law to speak to our community here for several years. Despite her path-breaking achievements and inspirational uh, record, Michelle is modest, and it took a couple of calls before I could persuade her that her journey would be precisely the right subject for this evening's lecture. Late last fall, when the Omicron clouds were gathering, I had the great pleasure of sitting down with her in my office over sandwiches, and I was impressed by her commitment to up -genera upcoming generations of LGBTQ students and others. So I'm confident that while this is Michelle Douglas's first time Speaking publicly at the McGill Faculty of Law, it will not be her last. Please join me in welcoming Michelle Douglas. Bonjour tout le monde. Good evening, everyone. Um, what a great honor it is for me to uh, join with all of you this evening and to those of you who are watching uh, on the video link. Uh, this is a long time in coming, as you've mentioned, but uh, I'm so glad that we could all be here in person. Um, I want to start by thanking Dean Leckie uh, for your personal kindness to the faculty I had the chance to meet with, and really to the students who just so warmly welcomed me here. A special thanks to the lovely uh, Professor Nandini Raman Ujam, uh, who who just connected with me and I think we had a really lovely conversation today. So also thank you to the Center for Human Rights and Legal Pluralism. Um, you know, it's hard when you might be seen to peak 
at 23 years old with something you'll be known for for the rest of your life. But um, tonight is actually a, a life highlight for me, and it's an honor so special, one I never could have imagined. So I'm going to deliver these remarks with a mixture of humility and, and pride also at this wonderful place of learning and scholarship. Um, of course, I would like to thank um, the IMK Advocates Law Firm who conceived of and have financially supported this uh, lectureship and also the Martin Roy Colloquium. Um, what, an, what an honor for me personally, but uh, it's really in imagining the future possibilities that really excites me and thrills me and imagines you know, the big bold ideas that will be expressed, the insights, and I hope also the hope that would come from such a, a series in the future. Uh, a moment of personal indulgence here to express my personal gratitude to um, Audrey Bachter. You've heard her professional accomplishments, but uh, uh, it's, it's her empathy, her caring, her standing up and showing up for survivors of the LGBT purge uh, class action that have really deeply touched me. And so I'm, I'm particularly um, delighted to to have her be part of this uh, as well. Um, finally, uh, as uh, by way of introduction, I, I'd like to dedicate tonight's uh, lecture um, to all of the lawyers who supported LGBT purge survivors and two LGBT purge, sur purge survivors and their, and their families who've struggled mightily but have received some form of justice. So this is a fundamentally personal story, but it's also a story that was shared by thousands of people. I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself and, and, and what happened uh, in my legal challenge that happened in the early 1990s, and we'll evolve from that. I'll reflect on a few other points. Um, and I hope you'll also gain an understanding of what is really a shameful period of time in Canadian history, a history not well known, one we now call the LGBT purge. I'm also going to do my best to show you a few images from the past, and we'll see how that goes as well. Um, I was a pretty mediocre student, <laughs> but I, after graduating from university, I went to Carleton University, where I majored in law. Um, I really wanted to be a police officer, and so I thought, you know, maybe I'll apply to the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, some municipal forces. Oh yes, the Canadian Armed Forces also has a military police. I'll, I'll, I'll apply there as well. So that was 1986. I went to the recruiting station and lo and behold, the Canadian Armed Forces called me back first. So I signed up and was actually really proud to serve my country in that way. It turns out that Service is a life pillar for me that has evolved in ways I never expected. So let me pick it up and tell you what happened when I joined the Canadian Armed Forces. So I, I told you I was a mediocre student, but I got very ready to join the military. I did chin-ups, I did push-ups, I got into shape, I was really ready to, to serve. By the way, those chin-ups came in handy for me uh, in, in my earliest days. Um, when, I, when I joined the Canadian Armed Forces, this was 1986, so let me also pause, especially to the law students and, and others here, and just underline for you uh, a broader context, and that is what was happening in Canada at that time. 1986, right? So it's a year into the operation of Section 15 of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. When I joined the Canadian Armed Forces, I started to excel. Uh, surprisingly, actually, I, I thought I would kind of uh, maybe struggle in the military, but it turns out we were a good fit. Um, I could do chimps, push-ups, and it turned out that when I was pursuing my class studies, I graduated at the top of every military course I ever took. Why is that important? Not for bragging rights, but I'll tell you later. So at the same time, 
Um, I think it's important for you to understand what the policy was regarding LGBT people by 1986, 1987. It had evolved from an outright ban, excuse me, um, to a policy that said, if you're gay, you can stay. But there are a few conditions. No pay, no pay raise, no promotions, no training, no postings. But if you want to serve your country under those conditions, you're welcome to remain. Oh, and there was also an obligation to report people you suspected of being gay. So incredible. That was what was happening in the midst of my service. Um, it was also during this time that I really fell in love for the first time uh, with a fellow officer, and she was wonderful. Now, to recognize my achievements in the military so far, I was told that I would be posted to a unit known as the Special Investigations Unit. What did they do? Okay. They investigated the most serious forms of criminality, espionage, sabotage, subversion, allegations of homosexuality. You see, it turns out that the career folks who were acknowledging me, in fact, I was only the second female officer ever to be posted to that unit, those people who said, right, this person can go far in the Canadian Armed Forces, moved me into that unit, while at the same time, I would soon become investigation, uh, an, an investigation target by the very unit I was working for. One day, uh, my boss came to see me. I was very new in this special investigations unit, posted to CFB Toronto. And my boss came and said, we have an important investigation to conduct. Gather your things. We're traveling from Toronto to Ottawa. I was nervous. My family lives in Ottawa. I thought maybe I could see them. I gathered an empty briefcase. I didn't know much yet. I barely had uh, anything in my in my um, drawers in my office. We headed out towards the airport on my way to fly to, to uh, Ottawa for this investigation I didn't know anything about. And just as we were about to go to the airport, on the airport strip, my boss in the undercover K car turned in to the hotel strip, pulled into a parking lot. He said, get out, follow me. We went up to the eighth floor of what then was known as the Constellation Hotel. I spent the next two days there being interrogated about my sexual orientation. These were tough times. I can place myself back there very quickly. It was pretty awful. Two men, military police officers, interrogating me about my sexual orientation. Now, I told you I'd fallen in love with another woman. Did I have an LGBT identity? Not, not really. I just know I love this person. And so I didn't have community politics. I didn't really associate identity with it. But I knew I had to be careful and hidden about my orientation, lest I be thrown out of the military or subjected to a policy, which frankly I didn't know much about at that time uh, either. So I denied it. I denied it for a long time. Uh, and they said, well, um, that's fine. There's really only one way to prove it. You, you'll have to take a polygraph exam. I said, there's no way I'll, I'll take that. There, no way. Well, I was subjected to ongoing harassment when I returned to the office that was pretty intense. Scarring, really. And ultimately, I said, yes, I will. Uh, take your polygraph exam. I was flown to Ottawa shortly thereafter, and while I was strapped to a polygraph exam, I came out to them and said, yes, I'm gay. Uh, and that moment changed my life. Then, of course, they didn't stop there. They were demanding to know who else I knew to be gay in the Canadian Armed Forces. And when I wouldn't tell them, they declared that my loyalty to the gay community 
was greater than to my country. That's not true. During this period, they also forced me, with 24 hours notice, to come out to my family. They said if I didn't do it, that they'd do it for me. So the good news is my family is loving and supportive and embraced me. They did not reject me, which is the story of many I know. But I'm hoping that they're watching tonight too, so I'm sending my love right back to you. Um, this was really the beginning of the end of my career in the Canadian Armed Forces. Remember I told you I had graduated at the top of every course I ever took in the military. That's me. receiving the top candidate award images from my basic security officer's training course. After that experience, I was marginalized. They didn't quite know what to do with me, but the clock was running out for me. And in 1989, after about three years of service, I was dismissed from the Canadian Armed Forces as being not advantageously employable due to homosexuality. So let me just say that again, because it, it, it is quite a striking um, line. Not advantageously employable due to homosexuality. This was Canadian policy. This was written down. This was codified discrimination. It did not matter how well you performed. It only mattered that you were LGBT and you were ultimately out. Despite this rhetorical idea or even a policy that if you're gay, you can stay, it didn't really much matter. They found a way to get you out. So I was fired in 1989. Recall Section 15 of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. I had occasion to go to a lecture and hear Canada's first openly gay member of parliament, Sven Robinson. That's a picture of the two of us right there. Sven was giving a lecture talking about what it was like to be an openly gay member of parliament. And at the end of the lecture, I stood in the lineup that forms often and waited to talk to him and said, I'm in real trouble. I'm about to get kicked out of the Canadian Armed Forces. I'm on my way out. I'm lost. I think I was in shock, to be honest with you. And I don't know what to do. And he said, I've been waiting for you. I've been waiting for a case like yours. Call me. So eventually, we connected. And he said, I'll take you to see a lawyer. And he did. And he helped me connect with my lawyer, Clayton Ruby, and Harriet Sachs, later Justice Harriet Sachs. While I was sitting in the office of this lawyer, overwhelmed, not sure, what do you do? Like, I don't know anything out about taking on the Canadian Armed Forces in a lawsuit. And he asked me the very direct question, what, what are you going to do? Are you going to sue them? Let's go for it. You have a great case. What will it be, yes or no? And I remember being so unsure what word would come out of my mouth. I didn't feel very courageous at the moment, I can tell you that. I felt scared and overwhelmed and unsure. And I said, sure, as long as I can do this anonymously. You see, I wasn't really out. I told you, I, you know, I was trying to catch up to this identity everyone else was ready to assign to me. But he said, no, it's, you know, lawsuits aren't anonymous. I learned that very quickly. But, uh, but we'll support you along the way. And you know, since I'm here, I think I'll just pause on that point to say, they showed me real kindness. They wrapped their arms around me. They knew there was real fragility in, in how I was experiencing everything. So uh, they also said, you know, 
the media is going to start calling you. You should prepare yourself. And I did speak to a Toronto Star reporter by the name of Michelle Landsberg. Many of you will know this name. She's an, a, an important Canadian figure in journalism, a feminist, and someone who wrote about me for the first time. And I said to her, I, I can't use my, my name, right? <laughs> like, you're not going to use my name. And she said, of course you would ask that. Um, and I'm going to make an exception, because I see what you're going through. And she kindly, kindly wrote about me under the pseudonym Miriam X. Her kindness was another measure that allowed me to keep going. Here were some of the headlines that appeared. Hers is the, uh, Michelle Landsberg is entitled, This is Military Intelligence? Sacked Lesbian Suing Forces. That's one of my faves. Now, at the same time we launched the lawsuit, what, what was the government doing? Panicking, big time. Um, and I'm going to read from you a letter that we've recently had access to that was written in the summer of 1992 by Marcel Mass. He was the defense minister at the time, and he wrote to Prime Minister Brian Mulroney. Now, this letter is really interesting, and I have a copy of it, but I'm going to highlight a couple pieces for you. This is a copy of the actual letter. Marcel Mass writes to the Prime Minister, if we proceed to try the Douglas case, there will be three unavoidable consequences. A, we will be perceived as refusing to acknowledge the existing law of Canada. This may well result in the award of punitive and exemplary damages. B, the Canadian forces reputation will be brought into disrepute. And C, the evidence generated at trial will seriously embarrass the government. I urge you, give your immediate approval to settle the Douglas case and the other pending sexual orientation cases and to abandon the current Canadian forces policy with respect to sexual orientation in accordance with the advice and recommendations previously provided by the Attorney General of Canada. Well, how about that? So, in October of 1992, you'll note that this is the 30th anniversary of that uh, decision, the government decided ultimately that they would lose, and they settled out of court. The military's codified policy of discrimination ended then and there. Now, what did that case do? Well, it, it was important for me, that's for darn sure. It also gave me a personal settlement, um, but it restored the rank and pay and I think dignity of all of those people who remained in the Canadian Armed Forces, experiencing that policy, still willing to serve, it restored their dignity and they righted those wrongs. Now, in the years since my groundbreaking lawsuit, um, I've worked with many folks, um, and we've intervened in other cases, and I started to find my footing as a legal activist, trying to look to the courts for justice that wasn't to be found anywhere else. I became an intervener with others in cases such as M versus H, both at the Court of Appeal and Supreme Court of Canada, the Delwyn Vreen case, and of course, equal marriage cases. As an aside, and, and you heard this in my introduction, at the same time, and maybe we can save this for another time, but I was also ironically working again for the government of Canada you should have seen the size of my conflict of interest declaration with them. Now, justice for one really isn't justice at all. I had some form of justice, 
back in 1992. And I didn't really know that there was anybody else who experienced what I did back then, but I came to learn it. And I learned about it in, I think, such a sad and heartbreaking way. I realized that there were thousands of people who went through what I did. So I'm gonna fast forward now to 2015, when the political conditions in Canada, that's a euphemism for the election of Justin Trudeau, uh, became more favorable uh, to the launching of a class action lawsuit to seek justice for all of the purge survivors. Here I especially again acknowledge my friend Martin Roy, Martin Roy, Alita Sitalik, and Todd Ross, who became the representative plaintiffs in a class action lawsuit and were represented by law firms IMK Advocates, Cambridge LLP, Kosky Minsky, and McKigan Hebert. Finally, we got to bring an entire class together to allow the courts, or really the law in its broadest sense, to be the final nudge of pressure that had been building for decades. If you think about it, it was really this time when labor, academics, activists, courageous politicians, allies, progressive religious leaders, all came together. The, the, the groundwork was laid, and their resilience and resistance for change happened was manifesting. It's about this critical mass coming together, the right ingredients squeezing into this crucible at that time. And of course, it has to be said that big change doesn't happen with just one form of pressure. It takes these many, many sustained pressure points for this kind of change to happen. And this is the idea of activism. This coming together with disparate areas, forming this kind of pressure, bringing the strengths that you have, seizing the moment, and taking action. And ultimately, in 2017, November 2017, so five years ago, we have Prime Minister Justin Trudeau in the House of Commons delivering an apology to the LGBTQ2 plus community. He said these words, it is our collective shame that Canadians who identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, or two-spirit were unjustly treated, fired from jobs, denied promotions, surveilled, arrested, convicted, and vindictively shamed because of their sexual orientation or gender identity. People lost their livelihoods, their families, and some their lives. Today, we offer a long overdue apology to all those whom we, the government of Canada, wronged. We are sorry. We hope by acknowledging our failings, we can make the crucial progress LGBTQ2 plus people in Canada deserve. He goes on briefly to say, we will continue to support each other in our fight for equality because we know that Canada gets stronger every single day that we choose to embrace diversity. And with that, we also had closely following the settlement of the class action lawsuit. The settlement of the LGBT purge class action lawsuit is a landmark settlement. There's nothing ever been like it anywhere in the world. The total settlement was $145 million, an amount not seen anywhere. And this gave justice to the thousands of those who experienced the purge. As my friend Douglas Elliott says, and he's right about this, sometimes justice delayed is still justice. And who are we talking about? The people just like me. 
LGBT purge survivors, to those whom I've dedicated tonight's lecture, who are they? Well, we think between the 1950s and the 1990s, during this period of the LGBT purge, we think some 9,000 people in the Federal Public Service, RCMP, and Canadian Armed Forces experienced this kind of discrimination. Today, in that class action lawsuit, there are approximately 720 members of the class. So there they are, maybe about 1,000 or so, it's hard to know for sure, uh, living purge survivors. This lawsuit, of course, delivered to them some measure of justice, but they can be, never be made whole for what they went through. The trauma that they live with is real. The Canadian Museum for Human Rights called the LGBT purge the longest running and largest scale violation of the human rights of any workforce in Canadian history. I think I have to say that again. That's pretty powerful. The longest running and largest scale violation of the human rights of any workforce in Canadian history. From the 1950s to the 1990s, we know these thousands of people had their career stymied or terminated because their sexual orientation or gender identity was considered a threat to the country that they had chosen to serve. During the Cold War, this, this discriminatory process was often justified on the grounds of national security risks Never proven, by the way, absolutely not, um, given their purported character weaknesses and susceptibility to blackmail by foreign agents. I told you I had to come out to my family on 24 hours notice because they used that um, assertion against me saying, if you don't come out to your family immediately, you could be subjected to blackmail. Of course, this was all done despite any evidence that such coercion, coercion had ever occurred. Um, I'm just going to, since I've dedicated tonight's lecture to uh, some of these folks, I, I'd like to um, show you a few, a few pictures uh, that tell you a story about who they are. This photo uh, was taken um, in the foyer of the Supreme Court of Canada, of course, the federal court, uh, uh, courtroom located within that building uh, where we had the approval of the uh, class action settlement. You see some of the purge survivors there. You'll note that many of them identify as women. Um, sadly, we have lost so many men who experienced the purge we lost them to HIV AIDS, we lost them to shame, to suicide, and many went back in the closet. So here we are, this fine group of Canadians who just wanted to serve their country, but they're finding their courage even in the midst of trauma. I never expected to live the kind of life that would leave me that would lead me here. Never. I didn't expect to leave this kind of mark. But injustice and discrimination can happen to anyone at any time. Everyone needs to watch out for it and speak out against it. Thankfully, the practice of law has an incredibly high professional integrity and practitioners, and the court remained independent and committed to upholding the rule of law. We need that now more than ever. We need to uphold these values and principles. I believe that we, all of us gathered here tonight, our allies, our friends, are all part collectively 
of bending that arc of the moral universe in the right direction. And if people say, I'm a dreamer for wishing it, I know I'm not the only one. Thank you. so much. And so now uh, we invite people with questions to go to the one or the other of the two standing mics. Sharon, will you show if, if there's something coming through remotely? We'll get it over there. Okay. Okay. Yes. Yeah. First, thanks a lot on, on behalf of the centre as well for this uh, uh, quite extraordinary uh, presentation and, and, and sharing that story with us. I had a couple of questions, small questions really, but one is, so the emphasis was obviously on the armed forces and um, you know, anti-LGBT uh, policies have existed in a lot of armed forces. Then at one point you uh, mentioned that actually the policy you know, covered the entire civil service uh, uh, right, and so I was kind of intrigued. Uh, I mean, maybe you could tell us more about the origins of a policy and how it was justified at the time. I mean, um, so you know, was sort of homophobia mixed with security concerns, or you know, what what was the how what, you know exactly how was it framed? And then the second is uh, maybe a minor point, but. Uh, you know, you, you mentioned that you had to sign a really long conflict of interest declaration when you started working for justice. I, well, you know, on some level, I could see why, but actually, I'd like I w wanted to maybe hear more about that and, and what was the nature of a conflict of interest. I mean, apart from the fact that you'd been uh, involved in, 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 you know, a particular case that they wanted you to have signed, and, and you know, how did your experience as a litigant, you know, affect uh, your experience working for justice? Thank you. Uh, I'll do my best with that. Um, the, the history of the purge is something we're still learning about. We are undertaking now as part of our work following the settlement of the class action through the work of the LGBT Purge Fund, which I have the honour to lead as its executive director. We're recovering historical documents to try and help under, you know, understand where this policy came from, what its origins uh, were, but we have a pretty good idea of where, where to look, uh, and that is south of our borders. We know that in the era of um, McCarthyism, the kind of Red Scare and the Cold War, uh, there was um, uh, uh, an elevation of concern around security clearances and so on. And uh, also, th th there were events in Canada that amplified that. For example, the Igor uh, Gazenko affair in Canada. And so the idea of reliability to your nation became under particular scrutiny. And ultimately, um, you know, there was, there was a heightened security awareness and looking for vulnerabilities. But of course, it, particularly in the, in the government, they, they didn't look at... Um, by the way, I'm not personally declaring these as vulnerabilities, I, I, just what they said. <laughs> but, you know, um, was, was someone having affairs? Was someone uh, having serious financial problems? They, they didn't look at those, for example, as, as one might. They looked at who was really a homosexual. Like, that was their target. They became particularly focused on this and were encouraged by uh, work in this area in the United States. So we hope to have more scholarship done in this area to really understand, like, how did it come north? What was so compelling? Uh, why did Canadian politicians fall for it? 
what was the climate? So we're going to be looking in all of that and, and, and releasing those documents to the public and, and, and encouraging uh, scholarship in the area. So um, on, the, on the other question about uh, my, my conflict of interest, in, in some ways, um, you know, this is an only in Canada story. I've sued the government a bunch of times as an intervener. And uh, they knew it, of course. Um, but the deal was I gave absolutely everything I could as a federal public service servant, neutral federal public servant. But also I said, I have a volunteer life and I'm going to be an intervener swearing affidavits against Her Majesty the Queen in, in court. And I thought it was fair that I, that I would tell them those things. Um, and so I, I filed these kinds of proactive disclosures, whether there was actually a conflict, I, I don't know. It's my, you know, I could certainly participate in these things, but they, they were also my employer. And I think um, I just didn't want to be fired a second time. So, you know, I decided to keep my, my nose uh, as clean as possible. I was very respectful to them and frankly grateful to continue to find a way to serve as I'd love to uh, in the federal government. So uh, yeah, one day I'll actually look at that conflict of interest declaration because I, I, I think it must be, uh, must be quite a pile of paper. <laughs> yeah, go ahead, Hannah. Hi, uh, thank you so much for your talk. I was very moved and I do want to say thank you sincerely to you and to Madame Hua for your bravery and for paving the way for people like me to go forward and have opportunities that were denied you. Thank you. I guess my question for you is what kind of positive changes have you seen over the course of your career? And perhaps you could speak also to what made you want to stay with the federal government even after they treated you so badly. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, it's also really nice to meet you and, and thanks for your question. I, um, there have been an incredible number of positive changes but, you know, I talked about the kind of the, the vectors of pressure that we need to apply. They, none of them came easily. In many cases, they took decades to achieve. Um, there were lots of folks who had similar circumstances to mine, but weren't the name behind the case that changed the law. So I, I know that uh, and acknowledge them, of course, that, that many, many fought with, without the um, the outcome I had, and later those who experienced some justice in the class action. But if you think about it, uh, you know, equal marriage was huge. Ending discrimination of policy was huge. We've had all of these changes in the policies and practices and laws in Canada. Uh, Bill C-16, uh, now uh, relating to the protection of gender identity and expression, was a really important piece of legislation. So there, there are many, many examples. People who can walk in the world um, with equality and dignity and respect uh, under protection of law, Th that's a big deal. Um, but there's still a long way to go. We, we know that there are lots of forms of discrimination and, and certainly creating space for leaders of um, people of color, uh, BIPOC people, uh, trans people, and, and, and others, uh, non-binary folks. You know, this, these folks have to be leaders. And, um, and I certainly want to create every space that I can to, to have those voices um, have platforms as well. And they do. They're, they're amazing. Um, so why did I stay in the government. You know, sometimes you go with what you know. And I think that happened to me. My father was a federal public servant. It was the family business in some ways. Um, and serving 
in the way I did was something that's really, really important to me. And I was also lost. The first place I went back to was the place who treated me so badly. But it's what I knew. I got a job after being fired by the military um, as a tax collector. I went to what I knew. I applied back to the government. It maybe didn't make a lot of sense, but it's, you know, you go to places you, you know. I eventually had a really, really good career and was able to advance in, in the government and had some amazing relationships with both my uh, my bosses and my colleagues, and I, I really loved finding a way to serve with integrity in that workplace, and I, I, I enjoyed it very much, actually. Michelle, I want to ask you a question. You, you mentioned in, this, in, in the talk the, the settlement and you just, from the class action, and you described it as landmark, and you mentioned the money and the number of people, but that's not the only landmark dimension to it, right? So, I mean, in the torts or extra contractual obligations class that we teach and experience with our students in first year. We explore the limits of the traditional liability model, plaintiff suing defendant, defendant giving money that ostensibly tries to make the plaintiff whole. But in your case, thousands of people, not all of them surviving. So the settlement is not just about money in the normal tort sense. Can you tell people a little more some of what's built in it's Thank a different you. kind of justice, right? And it's it, it is, and uh, you know, I'm so I, I, I step into this uh, very gently because I know some real experts on this <laughs> are are here, but there were some very novel parts of this settlement. So uh, there were there were financial payments to to purge survivors, but um, because. As I understand it, Canadian law does not allow people who are deceased to make, make these kind of claims for compensation. There, there are states, for example. So money was symbolically set aside uh, in an organization that's now been established as the LGBT Purge Fund, approximately $23 million, to represent payments that would have been paid to other, uh, other victims of the purge had they lived long enough to make a claim. This is profoundly important. This is the work, for example, of counsel for their innovative thinking in this area, and, and also to the representative plaintiffs who wanted to find a way to do some other creative things. The mandate of the LGBT Purge Fund is four things. It's to build the LGBTQ2 plus national monument. That will be built in, in Ottawa, unceded Algonquin land, and it will be inaugurated in 2025. We are also collecting the historical records, a sample of which I showed you tonight, where we're gleaning some of these really key insights into what was happening in the government, and, uh, and much further back as well. We're working on an exhibit with the Canadian Museum for Human Rights, where we'll tell the story of the purge. What happened? Where did it come from? Diving into the oral histories of, of survivors. And finally, we're working with the federal government. We're gonna help them be a better employer, more inclusive, more sincere diversity. These kinds of things, guiding, consulting, working with them, Remember, nothing about us without us, right? So they're talking to us, and we've provided um, a major landmark report to them called Emerging from the Purge, where we outline steps, recommend to them ways that they can be a better employer. Oh, there is one last thing, and it might be of interest to you. We also make grants. We do that for academic fellowships. We do a number of things. For example, we're, we're, we've got an oral history project that we're, we're really honored to fund. And the, the unwritten things that we do is that we're there as a community, right? These, these amazing people, purge survivors, have been just really looking to find each other. So there are new organizations sprouting up all the time to bring them together, to kind of share some of the pain they've been through and say, that happened to you too? You went in that same undercover K car to your interrogation? Wow. And it's been really rewarding. So those are the things that, that have come uh, from this uh, 
class action lawsuit that I think are innovative and creative. And one more thing, if I can say, um, I'm wearing a pin tonight that only survivors of the LGBT purge received. This went to any member who requested it and was part of the class action lawsuit. It's called the Canada Pride Citation. It was uniquely issued by the government of Canada. We're so glad and honored to wear it. It's kind of one of those pins that when people say, hey, where do I get one of those? That's a club people won't, don't really want to be part of, <laughs> but it gives us an education opportunity. And I, I noticed that there's at least two of them in this room tonight. I'm wearing one. Martinoa is wearing hers as well. Yeah, go to Darren. Thank you so much for coming today and for that really inspiring speech. I, I was wondering, um, if you might share, so I come from south of the border and, and remember quite vividly the struggles around all of these issues. Um, and within the LGBT community, how there were some tensions within the community about how this should be prioritized and whether it should be prioritized. Um, there were people who felt that, that there should be other goals of the movement rather than support people. And, and my feeling at the time was, and, and still was that people who want to serve the public should be welcomed regardless of who they are. But I was just wondering whether you experienced something similar here and whether that history is part of what's being documented. Yeah, I, I'm so glad that you raised the issue of, of documenting the, the complex history of how folks, uh, you know, perceive the injustice in the Canadian Armed Forces, in the federal public service, in the, in the RCMP. It was rare, I will say, from my own experience. This was pre-social media. I think it might be a different uh, situation today. But I really mostly received support. Uh, and I think uh, that may not be unique to all those who experienced the purge, but um, I, I think there's a fundamental sense that this was just such an unfair thing to do. It's bold discrimination. And most people saw that and they said, that, that, that's pretty horrible. Oh my goodness, you were, in, you were in the military and that happened to you? No, not Canada. And it's a veneer we have to take off because this did happen. It's this unknown history. But I think, you know, documenting critique of why anyone would maybe want to provide that kind of service, I, I think it's legitimate. Um, th this, is, this is what being in an open society is about. We, you know, there's, there's perhaps criticism that could be uh, analyzed and recorded. Um, but that will be for others to do. What I'm interested in doing is telling the story of what really happened to people who are very good people. And it breaks my heart, I'll say, to see sometimes in some circumstances that they don't even get to march behind a banner at a pride parade. I think before people are banned, the history must be known. Assumptions need to be challenged. Um, I'm standing up for those who experience this without question. So, but I do hope that in time, scholarship perhaps could be brought to this area. I think it would be really interesting. Who knows? I said we have a fund to, uh, to apply to. All are welcome to apply. I have a postdoctoral fellow who's <laughs> looking at it from a remedies sense at the settlement and trying to right. connect it to other kinds of restorative justice models and stuff. So the, some of that work is already starting. Uh, other questions? Yeah, come on down. Um, hi. Uh, first of all, I'd just like to, to thank again. As someone who is um, trans and bisexual, it's, it's very touching to me to hear stories like uh, the one we heard today and teared up a bit at sort of the 
the fact getting recognition for so many people that had been denied it for so long and the respect that I think had been denied for so long and as well this Thank you. Um, taking care to record a history that goes so often unrecorded is, is very meaningful um, to me. Uh, but my question sort of have one sort of more personal and one more systemic and I suppose choose to answer one or the other or both. On a more um, systemic level, I'm sort of curious, as someone who has been involved in your own lawsuit, in lawsuits as an intervener, and in the, the public uh, civil service, how you see the role of different elements of government when it comes to bringing justice. Um, and in particular, I was thinking about, of course, the court is often, um, by necessity, a last resort for gaining justice. We advocate, we go to the legislative branch, we talk to the civil service, et cetera, et cetera. So do you see the court's role as being confined to this last resort, or do you see it as working perhaps more harmoniously or less confrontationally with um, the legislature, with the civil service, with the executive uh, in terms of bringing justice? And then um, the more personal question, which again just sort of touches me as, as a member of that community is, you mentioned initially when you were bringing your lawsuit that you said, yes, if I can be anonymous, and they explained that you couldn't be. What is it, what did you draw from for the strength to go forward despite that? Because I know for me that it's been a really difficult journey in terms of myself, um, even within a supportive community. And it's, it's just amazingly striking to me having that courage, especially at that time, um, but thanks. Ah, uh, thanks. Uh, I, thank you so much for for those questions and and really um, speaking from the heart. Um, on your last question first, I, I've never felt um, particularly courageous or brave, sincerely. Okay, um, but I've always felt worthy. Um, I've always felt like I had inherent dignity. And. That, I think, can be a bit of a North Star to standing up, to finding the courage, digging down deep, standing proud, respecting yourself and loving yourself first. I think those are, are important beacons to hold on to you um, because they're true. They're true. Um, you know, not, I'm actually, you know, I'm sure there's so many other folks um, better placed than, than me to, to talk about the first question about kind of when do you turn to the courts? Um, but I know that in every kind of challenging position, sometimes the courts are that last resort that you can go to and can, can be more compelling than the outcome of an election. Because it, it's not a matter always of, of what the majority thinks. It's about fundamental justice principles. And you know this is where our beautiful Charter of Rights and Freedoms comes into play. You've always got that to turn to, another North Star. And you know I, I, I think accessing the courts is, uh, can be a great challenge for many, and I, I acknowledge that. But I've also been able to work with many lawyers who worked on a pro bono basis or, or otherwise to really put their heart and, and soul and their practice behind trying to, to move forward a movement to seek justice. And so it's always been amazing to me that people would work for less than they can earn on maybe a commercial basis, but to, to put everything into trying to bring justice for people. Uh, this is incredible that the idea, the concept of pro bono works and uh, is so alive, so that's amazing. Um, but really, uh, turning to the courts and having a fair hearing is justice in itself, I think. 
Um, and uh, it takes many different avenues of, of pressure to make change, but the court sure can speed things up. If I could add just on Casey's question and your answer. I mean, it's fascinating seeing the letter to the Prime Minister saying, right. this is going to embarrass the government. Please follow the recommendations you've already had, because that's, that was not the only instance in the 90s where the public service was telling the government, look, right. you're way behind on the LGBT thing, and it's, you're going to pay the price, right? So it's, it's, we sometimes think of government, we, you know, the constitutional people talk about the the courts and the judiciary and the legislature, but the government, is a, it's a very complicated beast and it was changing at different times, I imagine, different people in different pieces, for, right? For sure, for yeah. sure. There were just as much as, you know, they were saying, hey, listen, you're gonna be embarrassed. I know there were others who said, if you do this, it's an abomination, right? And somebody mercifully prevailed on the right side here. And, you know, you, you, that may be a surprise to some that it was Prime Minister Brian Mulroney, but there he was. And he, you know, he was the one who approved this. And I, I think that history is important to realize and, mm -hmm. and to, to document as well. Another question. Yeah, come on down. Hi, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, my question is, do you feel like the armed forces has done enough to reconcile for the experiences of LGBTQ people during the purge and to create um, an environment where LGBTQ people feel welcome and safe. And I'm also wondering, do you still hear stories of people facing discrimination that maybe causes them to leave the forces? Thank you. Thanks, uh, thank you very much. Uh, you know, what's happening in the Canadian Armed Forces today, um, military sexual trauma, uh, the, the uh, in some ways, the crisis in some senior leadership levels is pretty concerning. Um, but I know for a fact that they are working very hard to improve that. Um, Martine and I are, are frequently called upon to connect with them and to help, um, to hear what they're doing to hold them account. Um, and there are a whole bunch of people involved in that, but they are going through a very painful exercise. But are they doing enough? That is a big change management exercise because that is entrenched, right? If you think of misogyny, of the kind of toxic masculinity, of the structural organizational changes that need to be brought to bear there, that is a heavy lift but they're doing it from everything I know. Um, on the other hand, um, here, in this folder, to everywhere I go, um, is a letter of apology from former Chief of the Defense Staff, Jonathan Vance. Um, of course, he's now uh, before the courts. This just reveals the complexity of, of the situation. At once, he is the senior military officer, of course, uh, chief of the defense staff. Uh, he is no longer in that position. I should, of course, hasten that if you don't know. But, um, you know, writing the letter of apology, sincerely, I believe, uh, to, to purge survivors, that's just reveals the complexity of the circumstance. I'm not sure I have good answers, but I am working very hard with many, many, many others to, to try to hold them to account, to accelerate change where possible, and um, to keep telling the story of their history so that their current will be better and their future will be brighter. We have time for the final question, so come on down to the microphone. Thank you again for your very impactful um, discussion uh, today. It was you know, a, just a, a privilege to be here tonight. Um, I, I wanted to ask, I've been reflecting on what you've been saying about how um, you had a, a, a positive and supportive reception from, from those around you and how um, you know, the, the, the letter that we saw, I think clearly demonstrated that there was 
uh, at least some kind of an understanding of what was right and what was wrong at the time. And you said that when people read that, read, read your story, like they knew, like how, how could this be happening in, in the Canadian Armed Forces? It, it was just so, uh, so overtly discriminatory. But I guess my question is, how do you think that happened? Like who, what structures were in place? What tradition was in place that, that allowed um, allowed those policies to stand, and, and then I kind of think to, to um, I issues that we're facing today that on its face, um, you know, seem very overtly discriminatory to many people um, in, in our modern society. And, and I just wonder, what are, what are the things that, that, that you think that we should be doing um, to, to call out those issues when, when, when there seems to be a clear right answer, and yet there's still either political space or, or, or social space um, for the discrimination to continue? Uh, thank you. Um, you know, I think big institutions like the military are really hard to change. They become entrenched. They become calcified. They reflect views often a generation behind them. Um, and they did not keep up in the mid-1980s and early 1990s with where the Canadian population was and the kind of you know, emergence of a much more open uh, state of mind. I, I think, um, yeah, they become really entrenched in holding on to things that, that might push them to be more open-minded. Um, it threatens people. And that's probably why they didn't, didn't change. They, they really could demonize LGBT people they could see us as really, really different from them. And this is, this is pretty classic, right? They, don't, they, they hold on to this idea that they've figured it out and their way is better. And we have to break that down. And it's happened, of course. Um, but there's a lot still to be done. And you asked, you know, what do you do when you see it? But I think you, everyone kind of knows the answer, which is speak up about it. So th th that doesn't stand, you know, I don't stand for that. Challenge it. Um, form groups. I remember a, a young um, political science student speaking to me in a class and, uh, at, at, at a university. And she said, you know, nothing matters more than climate change activism for me, but it takes so long and it's so expensive and I don't know what to do. And it was just like, don't give up easily, be in for the long haul, be unbending in your commitment, join others to help you in what you believe in because chances are a lot of other people do as well. And keep adding to that intense form of pressure that doesn't allow others to get away with um, discriminatory conduct. And, and, and those are the things that you probably know innately and you're already doing. The good thing is, is that that dreamer line I talked about, I know I'm not the only one. Of course, that would be absurd. Everyone here has the idea of working to see things better for themselves and for others. And that's how we become a more open, loving, tolerant society in my eyes. So for a closing word and to thank our speaker, I'll turn the podium over to the Honourable Mr. Justice Alexander Pless, BA 94, BCL 98, LLB 98 of the Superior Court of Quebec. Justice Plesh, Plesh, I'm proud to say, is an adjunct professor in the Faculty of Law. I've, uh, I've been working on these remarks for a couple of days now. Thought I would get through it easily. No, I knew I wouldn't get through it easily. I thought I would get through it without showing too much emotion. It's impossible. <laughs> um, so 
I was counsel for the Attorney General of Canada in uh, the LGBTQ2 uh, purge file. And uh, one of the reasons why uh, it's so emotional for me to be here is uh, I was here, I was in that room. And that day when we approved the settlement in the federal court, uh, the the survivors of the purge testified in support of the settlement. And you saw the it, incredible harm, the unspeakable harm that was done to these people. In, in your name, by the way, in our name, in Canada's name. So, it's a privilege for me to be here with you. With I see Martin, I think, uh, to say thank you for the for your talk today. Um, you know, here in the faculty, of course, we uh, we celebrate lawyers a lot. We talk about their courage and uh, their great legal battles. And I think we easily forget, in fact, not only do we forget, we barely even talk about the fact. We, we refer to the cases by the names of the cases, but we almost never think about the, the clients. And uh, Michelle said she hadn't been courageous, but uh, <laughs> that's not true. <laughs> because uh, there were many, many, many people, many survivors before Michelle who couldn't. Uh, who couldn't withstand what was necessary to stand up to the to the Canadian government and to the army, and we, you know, nobody who hasn't been involved in litigation knows the emotional cost. Uh, it's not just saying I'm willing to be the plaintiff. It's uh, standing for humiliating cross examinations. It's living the uncertainty. You might lose. <laughs> you might lose and. It'd be for nothing. You suffered and you got nothing. And the most extraordinary thing, when you win, when you win, what do you get? You just get to be treated like everyone else. <laughs> That's it. You just get what everybody else takes for granted. So I, I don't want to just thank you for the talk. Uh, but also what, uh, what you've done. You, of course, share hope for all of us. You inspire people. You taught everybody here and everybody who knows your story that you can make a difference, that by standing up you can make a difference. You, you may remember I sent you a photo of my kids in front of your photo in Ottawa. They put up a, like a walk of fame for, for heroes of uh, the LGBTQT community. And of course, Michelle's a hero. <laughs> And I got to tell my kids that, that I knew her, that we'd worked together. I think they were proud of me. <laughs> I know because you're a hero, you make it easier for a kid to come out. So saying it, thank you is not enough. Right? We can't be here and not say what uh, I know a lot of people ask in their questions. You should never have had to go through this. 
my memory serves correctly, you were released in 89. The government didn't back down for, you filed your complaint, three years of litigation. This, is, this was not 1950, okay? This was not 1950, this was the 1990s. Sure, eventually the government did the right thing. It, oh, we're talking 20 years after Prime Minister Trudeau had said the state has no place in the bedrooms of the nation. And in 1969, the partial repeal of the criminalization of homosexuality in Canada. Charter was adopted in 1982. Section 15 came into force in 1985. The government had done these reviews. I talked about it. And it took that long. She had to fight. She didn't want to put her name on the procedures. She still had to fight. And it's happened because people failed to do the right thing. And some of the, the last question that was asked is, how did that happen? And I spent my whole career in the government as a, as a government lawyer. I chose to be a government lawyer because I wanted to serve, like Michelle. You know, victims should not travel along the road of becoming survivors alone. People have to stand up. Allies have a duty to act, right? Allies have a duty to act. Can't just be the people who are harmed, who are the, who are the victims of injustice. The people around who see it, that's one of the amazing things is how, how many people <laughs> would say it at the time but the people who had decision-making authority didn't have the courage to act. And one of the most, I would say, sad lessons of the, 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 the life that I had as a litigator and as a judge is that the adversarial context of litigation absolutely normalizes opposition. You file a complaint, and the first thing is not, is she right? It's how can we say no? And then you move into this process, and there's, a, and there's a habit. Can't discuss it, it's before the courts. It doesn't have to be that way at all. And I think it's important to remind everybody that Michelle shouldn't have gone through this. It would have been easy to do the right thing. It would have been easy to do the right thing. It didn't have to take so long. It would have been easy. It was just easier to do the wrong thing. So I want to say thank you. <laughs> thank you. But um, I hope that one of the lessons is not just, uh, is not just that, uh, the history lesson, but it inspires you all to stand up when you know what is right, to do something about it. Because sometimes doing the right thing is actually not that hard. It just requires you to do it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for being here this evening. Please come back soon to the Center for Human Rights and Legal Pluralism and the McGill Faculty of Law. Go safely tonight. We'll see you soon.